Hey everybody, welcome back for the second half of the chapter 11 lecture. So in the first half, I just finished off with vitamin D. That's right around where we finished class on Tuesday. Um, so, so far we've just learned calcium and vitamin D as, as two of the six nutrients that we're gonna talk about in relation to bone health. So let's carry on with vitamin K. Remember vitamin K is one of our four fat soluble vitamins vitamins D, E, A, and K, which means we can store some of it in the liver. Um, two forms of vitamin K that are common in our food supply, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Um, you don't need to, for our purposes, memorize the more um, chemical name, phyloquinone and menaquinone. Phyloquinone is K1, phylo meaning plant, right? So this is the form of vitamin K that we find in plants, in our plant foods. Um, again, because it's fat soluble, we're gonna see transportation in the blood in that chylomicron or in the lymph, excuse me, lymph to the liver um, in the chylomicron and then traveling around in those um, lipoproteins in the blood. <clears throat> and again, we can store some in the liver and a little bit in adipose and a really tiny bit in the bone as well. And then menaquinone, the animal form K2. Um, this is actually produced by bacteria that live in lar the large intestine. So we can actually make some vitamin K2 if we have the appropriate bacteria in our digestive tract. Um, maybe less is known about menaquinone in terms of how we absorb it and how we, you know, um, then utilize it throughout the body. But these are the two forms. Um, one of the things that vitamin K does is it acts as a coenzyme. So remember cofactor, coenzyme, these are the components of enzymes that are necessary to make the enzyme work. Um, and coenzymes are typically vitamins. So vitamin K is a coenzyme and vitamin K supports two different coenzymes. One that works in blood clotting or blood coagulation. So vitamin K supports clotting. And then another coenzyme that supports that bone metabolism, the bone um, remodeling. Here are your two structures. Again, maybe this brings you back to like the structure of basic fatty acid tail, right? All your carbons and hydrogens. And then maybe the ringed structure reminds you a little bit of a sterol. Right, so again, the structure of these fat-soluble vitamins resembles the structure of other fat molecules. Um, okay, so this is going over the, um, the specific enzymes that vitamin K supports in bone, um, in bone metabolism. So there's a cluster of proteins called GLA proteins, GLA proteins. And so these are proteins that work in bone production. And so the synthesis of these proteins is supported by vitamin K. Um, so one of these um, proteins is osteocalcin. And so this is secreted by the osteoblasts and helps in the calcification of bones. So helps in building the new bones. So the formation side of bone remodeling. And then <clears throat> um, vitamin K also supports the synthesis of the matrix GLA protein. And this is a protein that's located in the matrix of the bone, um, also found in cartilage and blood vessel walls and in soft tissue. And what we know about matrix GLA protein is that it may actually help to prevent calcification of the arteries and reduce risk for cardiovascular disease. So may prevent calcification of arteries. Vitamin K may be an important um, component of maintaining good cardiovascular health because it helps to reduce calcification or calcium buildup in the arteries. As far as how much vitamin A we should have, um, we, we don't have an RDA for vitamin K. There's no RDA or upper limit established. Um, this is kind of a newer, uh, more newly researched vitamin. I mean, we've certainly been learning about it for a long time. 
in the field of nutrition science, but we know less about vitamin K than we know about many of our other micronutrients. So at this time, we don't have enough information to determine a recommended dietary allowance. So we use the adequate intake, which is 120 micrograms per day for males and 90 micrograms per day for females. So not a huge um, daily requirement. Again, where do we get vitamin K? We can synthesize the menaquinone in the large intestine. Well, not us, but some of those symbiotic bacteria in our large intestine can synthesize vitamin K. And then the phyloquinone we can get from some of our green leafy vegetables. So kale, spinach, collards, and lettuce, just like our calcium. Um, again, adequate intake is not very high. We're talking micrograms, not milligrams. So, um, you know, one cup of, I don't know who's eating turnip greens, but if you are, good on you, um, right? But a cup of broccoli, a cup of Brussels sprouts, a cup of spinach, um, you know, a cup of salad, and you've basically met or exceeded your RDA, sorry, your adequate intake for vitamin K. Um, if we consume too much, right now we don't know much about side effects of too much vitamin K. Um, again, hard to do through diet alone. Usually that would come out through supplement, um, and there's not a whole lot of vitamin K supplementation happening, so we don't know yet what the side effects of too much vitamin K are. Um, we do know if you don't consume enough vitamin K, certainly you're not going to be clotting, so you would, we would be at greater risk for excessive bleeding. Um, vitamin K deficiency is also rare, again, because as far as we know, the, the daily need, the adequate intake is not very high. Most people are going to be getting enough vitamin K. Um, things that might cause vitamin K deficiency, fat malabsorption. So again, <clears throat> inability of the body to absorb fats. If we aren't absorbing fats properly, we're not going to absorb our fat-soluble vitamins properly. So some of the conditions that may contribute to fat malabsorption would be some of our digestive disorders, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, any of the inflammatory bowel disease um, disorders, and cystic fibrosis. Also, long-term use of antibiotics could lead to a deficiency. Again, not one-off use usually, but a long-term use of antibiotics may change the, um, the composition of the species of bacteria that live in your digestive tract and perhaps you no longer have enough of the bacteria that make vitamin K. Um, and it is not uncommon for newborns to receive an injection of vitamin K at birth because we know that their large intestine doesn't really have enough of the appropriate bacterial colonies to make vitamin K. Okay, so we've done calcium D and K, and then moving on to, we'll talk about our, miner uh, our other minerals, phosphorus, magnesium, and fluoride. So phosphorus we talked about when we talked about the electrolytes. Um, remember, phosphorus is the major intracellular, inside the cell, negatively charged electrolyte, right? Um, it's an essential, component, an essential component of all cells, both plants and animals. Um, phosphorus supports bone formation in humans. That's why we're talking about it here. Phosphorus is part of those hydroxyapatite crystals. Um, of course, phosphorus is required for that fluid base balance. Um, remember, we have um, phosphorus and potassium inside the cell, uh, and we have sodium and chloride outside the cell. Right? So those two things help to maintain the um, fluid balance inside and outside of the cells and in the blood as well. And then phosphorus is also a component of adenosine triphosphate, DNA, and our phospholipid bilayers, right? The phospholipid bilayers of our membrane. So anywhere we've talked about phospholipids, phosphate is present, phosphorus, excuse me, is present there. Um, the RDA recommended dietary allowance is 700 milligrams a day for adults. And again, compare that to vitamin K, we just said 120 micrograms, this is 700 milligrams. So not an insignificant amount um, that we need per day. Um, fortunately, most of our foods contain quite a bit of phosphorus, so it's not difficult to get adequate phosphorus. Um, most of the time where we have protein, because some of our amino acids contain phosphorus, we're gonna get good, um, good amount of phosphorus. So uh, meat, eggs, legumes, 
And then <clears throat> something to actually look out for is that a lot of um, processed foods may also have phosphorus as an additive. So it's actually, we're more at risk of having too much phosphorus. Um, we're less at risk of having not enough phosphorus. Um, so it can be a food additive um, to help retain moisture. Um, so a, um, a humectant, we might call that, is a food additive that helps to retain moisture. And then um, also in soft drinks, a lot of soft drinks have a lot of phosphoric acid, especially Coke. Um, so one of the risks of too much phosphorus is premature mortality. So high intake associated with premature mortality. I should highlight soft drinks. So if you consume too much, right? Um, uh, basically muscle spasms and convulsions, right? Too much. So again, your body, right? Phosphorus is required for that fluid balance, your body's production of energy, the maintenance of your cell membranes, your bone health. So too much of it can kind of throw your body into kind of metabolic kind of wackery. So muscle spasms and convulsions. Um, again, we get too much phosphorus um, could be due to excessive vitamin D supplementation because just like with calcium, vitamin D is going to increase um, absorption of phosphorus from our food. Um, could be from overconsumption of soft drinks, um, like you know daily consumption of you know a six a six pack of cokes or a liter of coke. Like a lot of of soft drink intake can lead to excessive phosphorus levels. Also, some antacids contain phosphorus. And so prolonged use of phosphorus-containing antacids could also lead to too much phosphorus. On the other hand, not enough phosphorus, like I said, is relatively rare. So not enough deficiencies are pretty rare in healthy adults, especially um, uh, in more developed parts of the world. Um, certainly phosphorus deficiency can occur throughout the world, but generally in the United States, it's pretty rare. Um, some of the kind of causes of phosphorus deficiency would be alcohol abuse, um, can occur in alcohol abuse, premature infants, and elderly people with poor diets. So again, <clears throat> alcohol abuse may just be because the alcohol is taking place of food, when the food would be the thing that contains the phosphorus. Um, prematurely born infants, depending on what type of diet they're fed. And then, of course, as we age, absorption decreases. And sometimes, um, we'll talk more about this in Unit 5, but sometimes we, we lose our taste, we have difficulty swallowing. Um, a lot of times, anorexia in older adulthood is not uncommon just because there's a, a total loss of appetite. Um, and so, maybe the person isn't just eating enough or their food choice is not as healthy as it was. And so they may become deficient. So those are kind of the three cases where we may see phosphorus deficiency. But as it says, in, in a healthy adult, phosphorus deficiency is pretty rare. The magnesium, I have to admit, magnesium is one of my favorite nutrients. Um, where do we see it here? This, I think, is really key. So we've talked about how all of these micronutrients support, you know, a dozen or a few dozen different systems or different functions in the body. Magnesium is one of these like in incredible powerhouse nutrients. So just in terms of like enzyme support alone, magnesium supports over 300 different enzymes. And some of those enzymes work again in ATP synthesis, so energy production pathways, DNA synthesis, so cellular growth, cellular repair, Protein synthesis, same thing. Um, just like calcium, just like phosphorus, our body will regulate blood magnesium levels. The kidneys, again, play a major role there because they can excrete excess and help and reabsorb um, more from the urine when blood magnesium levels are low. So just like we saw with calcium, um, the more we take in, Actually, the body's usually going to decrease the absorption, right? And, and that's, again, not, not only true with calcium and magnesium, but most of our nutrients. We kind of have a, we, we generally have like a set point for how much we can actually absorb. 
and eating more at one meal doesn't usually does not equate to greater absorption. So again, as with calcium, the best way to have adequate calcium in your body, sorry, the best way to have ad adequate magnesium in your body is to consume magnesium rich foods throughout the day, not just one time. Also excessive alcohol intake may impair absorption of magnesium. Um, <clears throat> so those hydroxyapatite crystals we talked about in the beginning of the chapter lecture, again, magnesium, phosphorus, calcium, make up the um, mineral structure around the collagen at the core. There is a picture in your textbook, and I apologize that it's not in these lecture slides, but take a look, it's kind of cool to see. Uh, so that means 50 to 60% of the magnesium in our body is stored in our bones, and then the rest of it is stored in soft tissue. So this is unique too. Phosphorus, calcium, magnesium are unique in that we do store little bits of them. Um, many of our other minerals we don't really have storage for. Same with our water-soluble vitamins. So magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium, we store those in the bone, fluorine as well, which we'll get to next. Um, and magnesium, again, we can store some in soft tissue. So in addition to enzyme um, acting as a cofactor, um, magnesium, again, also supports bone structure. So it supports those hydro, it is part of those hydroxyapatites. Um, works in conjunction with the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D, again, just to maintain the bone structure. Magnesium can also work with insulin and improve the um, peripheral cells sensitivity to insulin. So helping the body work really well, working nice and harmoniously. Um, magnesium also supports vitamin D metabolism and action, as well as muscle contraction and blood clotting. So there's just sort of an endless amount of functions for magnesium, which I think is why I find it so exciting and why I like magnesium so much. Um, well, that's funny. Of course, the RD, of course, the RDA varies based on age and sex. Again, you can find in your textbook, uh, I think it's on the front flap, at least in the fifth edition, um, the RDA tables. So you can go ahead and see what the RDA recommendation is. Um, it's lower than phosphorus. So the upper, the upper limit intake for magnesium is set at 300 mg per day. Um, of course, again, there are situations where somebody may be so magnesium deficient that they would supplement above that for a short period of time under medical guidance to bring their body magnesium levels back to a healthy range. Um, just like with phosphorus, a lot of our foods contain magnesium. So it, it, uh, we can not consume enough magnesium, but if we eat a healthy diet, we're likely to consume enough magnesium. So green leafy vegetables, whole grains, seeds, nuts, seafood, beans, and even some dairy products. Um, when we eat uh, magnesium-rich foods with protein, protein can actually in improve our absorption of the magnesium from the, from the intestines. And then, as I sort of just alluded to, if we eat a lot of junk food and not a lot of whole foods, we're likely to become magnesium deficient because junk food and processed food has generally lost the magnesium content. Um, let's cut back out because I did the thing where I didn't pay attention to whether or not I started recording. It looks like I did. Phew. Okay. Let's check. All right. Food sources of magnesium. <clears throat> um, again, so spinach, beans, beans, pumpkin seeds, brown rice, halibut. Right. They do all have magnesium, and again, if you're eating, you know, spinach and black beans at one meal, that's actually going to get you pretty good, pretty close. Um, and then maybe you have some rice and beans with pumpkin seed and maybe some halibut, you'd be there, right? So focusing on whole foods will easily get you the magnesium that you need in a day. But if we only ate processed foods, Right, or we only have one meal of whole foods, we're likely, especially for males, we're very likely to become magnesium deficient. So these are showing adequate intake for adult females. It's about, you know, a little more than 300 for adult males, about 400 milligrams per day. If we consume too much magnesium, so again, 
We don't generally see issues arising from too much dietary magnesium, from just eating these magnesium rich foods. Um, again, you'd have really have to eat a lot of food and whole food at that to take in too much magnesium. Plus your body's already gonna regulate um, and decrease the absorption of magnesium if you are ingesting too much. So again, usually hypermagnesemia or high lead magnesium levels only comes from excess supplementation or some sort of metabolic impairment. So somebody with impaired kidney function where they're not able to excrete excess uh, magnesium may, may wind up with hypermagnesemia. Um, antacids can affect kidney function. So someone taking, uh, again, prolonged use of antacids may wind up with hypermagnesemia. Otherwise, it's really only through <coughs> over supplementation of magnesium. So symptoms, as we've seen so often, diarrhea, nausea, cramping, dehydration, and then um, acid-base imbalances as well. So again, the body trying to get rid of or expel these excess um, these, this excess nutrient. And if we don't consume enough, so again, hypomagnesemia is unfortunately not uncommon. For, for as widespread as magnesium is in our food, it's only in whole foods. So in the United States, we eat a lot of junk food, right? And a lot of people eat only junk food or only junk food or processed food and not enough whole food. So unfortunately, hypomagnesemia is not uncommon. Um, we would see muscle, muscle cramps because magnesium actually helps the muscle relax. Calcium helps it contract. Magnesium helps it relax. Uh, so we can also see muscle spasms or seizures or nausea, weakness. Again, magnesium helps in ATP production, um, DNA production, protein synthesis, <laughs> growth, um, cell turnover. So irritability, confusion, weakness, nausea. Um, long term, we could actually see osteoporosis um, with hypomagnesemia uh, because we are likely to also see hypocalcemia um, with prolonged hypomagnesemia. Um, hypomagnesemia is also associated with many chronic diseases, so heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes. So remember, um, magnesium helps improve insulin sensitivity, right? Um, help again helping acid base balance so we can wind up with I mean hypomagnesemia alone is probably not the only cause but usually if we are low in magnesium right we're not eating very well so we may be ingesting some things that are like further leading us down the path of heart disease high blood pressure or type 2 diabetes so again hypomagnesemia is generally due to poor diet um, but could also be due to, again, a kidney disease where maybe the body's not reabsorbing enough magnesium when blood, blood, when blood magnesium is low. Again, excessive alcohol intake um, and chronic diarrhea as well. So again, areas where the body's either not reabsorbing enough, excreting too much, um, or interfering with, interfering with intake, like alcohol abuse would usually lead to poor um, food choices and not adequate um, whole food intake, which would just lead to dietary deficiency of magnesium. All right, and then fluoride is the last nutrient for chapter 11. Um, fluoride, the three um, minerals we've talked about so far are major minerals. We require them in larger amounts. We have more of them in our bodies. Fluoride is one of our trace minerals. So just like these other three, magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium, fluoride is stored in our teeth and bones. Um, calcium and phosphorus and magnesium work to form the hydroxyapatite crystals. Calcium, phosphorus, and fluoride can form fluorohydroxyapatite crystals in the teeth. Um, we, we don't have as much magnesium in the teeth, right? Magnesium is really in the bones and some of our other top soft tissue. So we have similar crystalline structures in our teeth, similar to what we have in the bones, but in the teeth, we only have calcium, phosphorus, and fluorohydroxyapatite. 
So fluoride helps to develop and maintain the teeth and bones. Again, combines with calcium and phosphorus to protect the teeth from bacteria. That's part of what these fluoride hy fluorohydroxyapatite crystals can do. And of course, helps to stimulate bone growth, just like phosphorus or calcium or magnesium would. The average, um, the adequate intake, excuse me, for fluoride, again, varies by sex and age, but it's generally one to four milligrams a day. So again, this is why we call it a trace mineral. Phosphorus was 700 megs per day. Magnesium, what did we just say? We didn't look at the RDA, but the adequate intake is basically 300 to 400 megs per day. So <laughs> a difference of several hundred here on the order of, on the order of a few hundred is the difference. So that's Kind of a, that's part of what makes fluoride a trace mineral and calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium uh, major minerals. Where do we get fluoride? So a lot of municipal water supplies are fluoridated. Um, there's also a lot of toothpastes are fluoridated. Um, and then you can also get a fluoride treatment at the dentist's office because some people prefer to filter their water, um, but when not all, but most water filtration systems are going to filter out the fluoride, and then you can choose non-fluoridated um, toothpaste, but then you're really not getting any fluoride. So in that case, you could go and get um, periodic fluoride treatments at the dentist's office. We don't have so much fluoride in our food. Um, what happens if we consume too much fluoride? We can wind up in a condition with a condition called fluorosis. Excess, excess fluoride. Um, and what happens here is that the protein content of the tooth enamel gets too high and can actually cause, um, um, again, pores or holes in the teeth. So we'll start to see this sort of pitting in the teeth or kind of earlier on, like a staining in the teeth. So it makes the teeth porous, basically. Um, and if we don't consume enough, right, this is another classic example of like too much is, is a problem, too little is a problem, it's kind of we need to be right in that sweet spot in the middle. If we don't have enough, we can certainly wind up with cavities. Again, the fluorohydroxyapatite crystals are protecting your teeth from bacterial destruction, right, because certain types of bacteria in your mouth can decay the enamel and can expose the inside of the teeth um, to inflammation and deterioration. So uh, we need fluoride to protect our teeth. That's why we have it in our water and in our toothpaste. Um, but of course, too much can also be a problem. So this is a, an image of fluorosis, right? So not so much staining going on here, but you start to see even like on the bottom of this tooth, Right, um, discoloration and then the pitting is pretty intense. Okay, so a little overview of these six nutrients essential for bone health. So this is table 11.2 in your book. Um, also, I suggested that you read chapter 7.5 when we started this unit, because I did not go over chapter 7.5. It's just sort of a, a nice sort of at a glance view of vitamins and minerals. It's a really nice introduction to vitamins and minerals. Great to review at any time. Um, so this just goes over the RDA charts for calcium, vitamin D, K, phosphorus, magnesium, and fluoride. Um, again, you'll see all but fluoride are major minerals. Magnesium, so yeah, so the RDA is 310 for females, as we saw, and then 400 mg per day for males. Usually when an RDA is known, the adequate intake is also written at about the RDA. So that's why we saw that on the chart earlier. Okay, so then just in wrapping up chapter 11, we will just go really just take a look at osteoporosis. I think that's, um, I think that's the only disorder we talk about in this chapter associated with bone health. I could be wrong though. <laughs> I might surprise myself in a couple slides. So osteoporosis, we've, we've introduced this briefly um, in class on Tuesday. Osteobone porosis meaning literally porous. So osteoporosis is always characterized by low bone mass, low bone density. Remember you can do a DEXA scan um, and get your T-score. And if your T-score is low, lower than negative 2.5, you can be diagnosed osteoporosis, and that just means you don't have dense 
bone mass anymore. So effectively your bone tissue is deteriorating um, and as bone tissue deteriorates, that internal scaffolding is literally becoming more porous. The bones become more fragile and are more prone to rip, um, fractures and breaks. Um, in osteoporosis, we can also see something called bone compaction, which is where the bones literally compact. So when you've got these long bones, like you have in your arms and your legs, um, when you start to lose some of the structure of the bone, the bone can literally compact. And so we can see actually a decrease in height due to bone compaction as a result of osteoporosis. Another thing we can see is something called kyphosis or the dowager's hump. Um, and this usually occurs with, with age, also usually goes along with posturing, like how you, a person carries themselves throughout the day, throughout their lifetime. Um, but kyphosis is where you wind up with like a pretty significant hump in kind of the middle of the spine. Um, there's a picture. <laughs> so the dowager's hump, right? Again, maybe spending a lot of time sort of hunched over and of course, when you're in your middle life, you know, your body's still kind of young and agile and supple, but you're hunched over a lot. So as you get into your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe, right, that hump may become more and more prominent. So that's kyphosis, um, which is usually also associated with osteoporosis. Um, we can subclassify osteoporosis as type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is usually associated with um, postmenopausal females, and it's a decrease in the trabecular bone, again, that spongy scaffolding bone in the, in the middle of the bones, um, as a result of decreased estrogen production. So one of the things that estrogen does during, um, you know, during the teen years and the early adult years, I guess, the, the 20s, the 30s, 40s, um, is help with bone reformation and maintaining bone density, maintaining that increasing. So as estrogen levels start to decline, we start to see, again, a greater rate of bone resorption, or we're losing bone, and less bone formation. So type 1 osteoporosis is usually associated with that estrogen decline in menopause or after menopause. Um, often affecting, um, again, the spine, but maybe some other areas of the body like the wrists, right? Some of those other long bones. Whereas type 2 osteoporosis is what's, you know, really associated with aging. Um, I've not often heard it called senile osteoporosis, but um, I haven't spent a lot of time, I guess, in, uh, um, in bone medicine. So type 2 osteoporosis, again, the one that's usually associated with aging, both males and females, um, we see a decrease in trabecular bone and in cortical bone, right? So again, really associated with aging. Again, more bone resorption, less bone formation as we age. So again, typically affecting spine and also some of those larger bones of the body like the hips. So this is where older folks... Um, Again, this is where like health throughout the lifespan is really important because we, you know, in the early part of the life life cycle, infancy, childhood, teen years, we have the ability to build our bone density really high, and then throughout adult years, we have the we have some capacity to maintain that peak bone density. But again, by like middle adulthood, bone density is definitely going to decline. But we can still slow the rate of decline by eating well and getting adequate exercise. So um, when osteoporosis occurs, uh, hip and spine are at greatest risk for fracturing. Both types of osteoporosis more common in females, again, due to the estrogen decline. And then here's a little x-ray scan. So on the left is healthy um, pelvis region, right? And on the right, you can kind of make out the osteoporotic bone a little bit. You just sort of see how um, uh, kind of, I don't know what the right word is, like more solid, right? The bone looks throughout, like really beautiful outline for every bone. You can make out the cortical bone in some areas um, and just, uh, more solid through the areas that would be trabecular bone. Whereas we come to the right, um, we can still make out good areas of um, 
cortical bone. When you start to look in the sections that would be trabecular bone, like particular particularly down here at the bottom of the spine, and even here when you look at the head of the femur, femurs, um, right? Boy, kind of misshapen. You can't quite see the edges as clearly, um, and you start to see kind of more black holes. Again, literally the pores um, in that trabecular spongy bone. I like this picture a lot from uh, your text 11.16. So again, on the this one is reversed. So the healthy vertebrae is on the right. And you'll see again the scaffolding. I think this is a great picture of your trabecular bone and that scaffolding. This is, this is kind of what I was talking about, about scaffolding. And it's like a sponge, right? You do have these pores. But in osteoporotic bone, you start to have these gaping pores, right? You, we're literally losing the scaffolding. Right? We're literally seeing more reformation, breaking down the bone to release calcium or phosphorus or magnesium or fluoride into the blood and then not replenishing it. So we're literally just breaking the bone down. And then, of course, the more that this is happening, the weaker the bone is, right? If, if somebody gets hit right here, you know, whether they fall or a car accident or something, if they get some sort of um, blunt force to this part of this vertebrae, it could literally kind of snap in half or shatter, right? And also where we can see the compaction, not just in the long bones, and I, as I had mentioned, but also in the vertebrae. The vertebrae will literally compact as you start to have so much um, porous space here. Okay, so risk factors for osteoporosis. This should hopefully kind of be a review as we're at the end of the chapter here. But again, as we get older, we increase our risk for osteoporosis because our bone, bone mass is literally declining. Um, sex, again, females are going to be at a greater risk. Genetics, genetics does play a role here. And then look, these are all of the um, modifiable risk factors, right? The things that are in our control. Right, so a prolonged tobacco consumption throughout the lifespan, alcohol consumption throughout the lifespan, prolonged caffeine consumption, poor diet, physical inactivity, right? We can, in most circumstances, make changes to all of these things and decrease our risk for osteoporosis. Obviously, age, sex, and genetics, we don't have much control over. Um, I like this picture a lot. So this is showing peak bone density, right? The timeline is a little bit off. Peak bone density would usually be reached around here. And you can see just kind of a rough chart of this would be the bone density level, the fracture zone. This would be the bone density level at which fracture becomes very plausible. So once we hit, you know, mid 50s, the age of onset of menopause for females, we kind of have two options, right? We can follow kind of a standard American diet and a standard American lifestyle of sitting around on our computers all the time. And we're gonna pretty rapidly reach that um, bone fracture risk zone, right? Maybe by our mid 60s, mid to late 60s. Well, I guess that's 70. Or we can choose to follow a healthy diet and help follow a healthy lifestyle, even if you haven't yet. Even if you've hit, you've hit 55 and you've lived a really unhealthy lifestyle, it's actually often not too late to start following a healthy lifestyle. Um, and so theoretically, menopause could hit, and you know we started off with good bone density. Obviously, if you don't start off with great bone density, you're going to hit the fracture zone earlier. But we started off with great peak bone density. We hit menopause and we maintained a healthy lifestyle. Boom, we actually never reach the fracture zone, right? Maybe, maybe when we get to 100 years old, we might reach the fracture zone. So again, just saying that these, these modifiable risk factors, that's maybe too technical of a term, these are behaviors. These are choices that we can, we can choose to engage in these behaviors or choose not to engage in these behaviors, right? We can choose to eat well, then usually, we can choose physical activity, usually. We can choose alcohol cessation or reduction, tobacco cessation, caffeine reduction, usually, right? So when these things are in your control, you know, you maybe think about it. <laughs> and what choices do you want to make for yourself, for your life, for your life, for your health? 
Um, so this term again, right? Modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So modifiable, again, these are all the things in a person's power to change. So whether you're talking about yourself or you're working with patients in your future career, or you're talking with family members or friends, like all of these things on this left column are things that we could potentially um, address. So again, smoking, body weight, calcium intake, sun exposure, alcohol abuse, um, history of amenorrhea, failure to menstruate in females with inadequate nutrition, so nutrition, um, estrogen deficiency, um, may not have direct control over, but could work with your doctor there. Same with testosterone. Um, falling, I mean, sometimes we can't always prevent a fall, but maybe. And certainly sedentary lifestyle, right? We can change that. We can become less sedentary, become more active. And then the non-modifiable risk factors, right? Things that you, you and no one else can really change, right? So age, um, race, uh, your history of fractures, you know, at that point, you can't change that. Family, again, genetics, uh, sex, um, and then amenorrhea, where it may not be related to poor diet, right, or inadequate diet. So sort of history of amenorrhea related to some other cause. Uh, okay, I guess we go through each one of these. So age, again, bone mass decreases with age, hormonal changes with age and decreased bone density and we have less vitamin D metabolism as we age, right? Which again is going to lead to less, or is part of the contribution with, um, contributes to less bone formation, putting fewer of these minerals back into the bone. Sex, so again, osteoporosis more, more so affects females than males. Females often have lower bone density um, than males starting out. Um, Again, we get the age-related hormonal changes for females. And unfortunately, um, I suppose we could question whether or not females are at greater, are more susceptible than males to um, kind of dieting and extreme weight loss. Maybe they are, maybe we just don't, maybe we don't talk about it with males as much. But certainly in teen years, when, when a female could be reaching her peak bone density, Oftentimes, females are very um, subject to and susceptible to um, extreme dieting and extreme um, extreme body image um, extreme body image issues, right? So they lead to very low weight and um, in a, an actual inability to maximize bone density. Genetics again, just family history. Um, Non-Hispanic Caucasian females um, who have a first degree relative, like their mom or their sister who has low body weight and had osteoporosis are at greater risk for osteoporosis. Um, and then again, kind of the genetic um, predisposition to estrogen levels in menopause can also influence um, risk for osteoporosis. And then our, some of our modifiable factors, so tobacco, alcohol, caffeine, so cigarette smoking, uh, that should be an A for effects, hormones that influence bone formation and resorption, so cigarette smoking can reduce bone remodeling. Um, again, alcoholism, usually alcoholism causes poor dietary intake, which would lead to or bone mass and higher risk, higher rate, higher risk of fracture. And caffeine is likely to cause urinary um, excess calcium loss through the urine. So um, there isn't really a standard recommendation on caffeine intake. I mean, certainly some, some experts recommend as low as you can get it, uh, but I've heard on average like 200 megs of caffeine per day, which is about eight ounces of a standard cup of coffee. So definitely we could consider our caffeine intake. And then nutritional facts, the nutritional factors, this is kind of what we've been talking about um, with all the different nutrients. So fruit and vegetable consumption is really important. Uh, a lot of you wrote about that in your My Diet Analysis project. So many of our, many of our um, micronutrients we only get from fruits and vegetables, and particularly um, vitamin K and magnesium are 
sort of exclusive to plant foods. Um, again, vitamin K, we can make some of it. Also vitamin C, pretty exclusive to plant foods. Again, um, excessively high protein intake is likely to cause calcium loss from the bones um, or from the body in general. So being mindful of too much protein. Um, of course, low calcium and low vitamin D. I mean, low of any of these nutrients we've just been talking about, calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, magnesium, phosphorus, and fluoride. If you don't have enough, you're going to have low bone density. Um, and then there's, there's some um, speculation that high sodium intake could also interfere with body levels of calcium, magnesium, phosphorus. Um, so just being mindful of sodium intake can be helpful. And then physical activity, right? So of course, again, regular exercise protects against bone loss and protects against osteoporosis, particularly weight-bearing activities. So anything where your muscles are working against gravity. So walking, jogging, um, literally strength training with, with weights, um, push-ups, pull-ups, right? Anything where your, your body and therefore your muscles and bones work against gravity, you're literally stressing the bones and that positive stress on the bones stimulates bone remodeling. Make that note, make that edit in your notes. It stimulates bone remodeling, right? And bone remodeling may, helps to maintain bone density. So exercise is good stress on the bones, but make note that something like riding a bike or swimming, you're not against gravity at that point, right? So you're actually not, it's not as weight bearing. I mean, cycling a little bit on the legs, um, but it's not as weight bearing as jogging or again, strength training exercises. Um, we will also talk about in unit four next week, something called relative energy deficiency in sports. Um, and this is kind of a combination of, um, yes, doing sports, but not actually eating adequately to support the body in sports. And so again, th this is very common in um, school-aged athletes. So middle school, high school, college, right in those peak bone density forming years. And so if, if it is, you know, heavy athletics and energy deficiency, the person isn't consuming enough food, enough calories and enough nutrients to replenish their body from the exercise. And so while, even though the person is exercising, they're not eating well enough to support bone, reform, um, bone remodeling, right? And so relative energy deficiency in sports while the exercise part is good, the nutrition piece isn't there, and so that can negatively impact bone health. That can lead to low bone density. And then we'll also talk about the female athlete triad, which plays right into relative energy deficiency in sports. So this is a female menstruating, um, female menstruating athlete. I don't know if those are the three things. Um, but again, being female and going through menstrual cycle, kind of excessive bleeding once per month, um, also being an athlete, potentially not eating well enough. Again, it's kind of three key things that subject the body to not building enough bone density. We'll talk more about that in unit four. How is osteoporosis treated? So unfortunately, once the bone, once that bone density is gone, it's gone. We can't really cure it. The best we can do is to slow the progression of osteoporosis. So again, I'll go back to this image, right? The best we can do is A, <laughs> is just slow the rate of decline, right? We can't, we can't forego the decline, we can't avoid the decline, but we can certainly um, slow the rate of it. So how do we do that? The same, all these same, same things we've been talking about, the opposite of the risk factors, like just do the things that, that are the opposite of the risk factor. So consuming enough calcium, consuming enough vitamin D, consuming enough magnesium. And this is, this is true to build bone density, you know, again, during childhood and adolescence. This is also true to maintain bone density throughout adulthood, and again, to slow the rate of bone density decline throughout later adulthood. Continue to do weight-bearing exercises throughout the lifespan. Continue to do weight training or resistance training. 
talk with your primary care provider or your nurse practitioner about the medications you're taking, figure out if you're taking any medications that would cause bone density loss, right? So again, very similar with heart disease, with type 2 diabetes, like there's so much we can do there's so much we can do to prevent these diseases, and then there's still so much we can do, so much that's in our power to do, even if we get this diagnosis, to at least slow the rate of progression. Or in other cases, not osteoporosis, unfortunately, but in other cases, actually reverse the disease, like type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So I think that's it for chapter 11. Um, as always, I'll just sort of thumb through these review question slides, and you can Take a look. Um, yeah, so I'll stop yapping. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you for class on Thursday.